Hello, everybody. Thank you uh, for joining us all today to hear from a very exciting panel of education leaders and partners who are deeply involved in the development and implementation of youth apprenticeship programs across the nation. Uh, we have a range of perspectives represented here today from school leaders to community college administrators and state agency partners. But before I introduce you to our panelists, I want to remind everyone to please submit your questions in the chat uh, throughout the session. And I will be addressing those questions um, at the end of the session. And hopefully we get to all of your questions. And so I wanna introduce our panelists. Uh, the first panelist is Lisa Cook. She is the Dean of Liberal Arts and Social Sciences in Berkeley City College in California. Uh, she provides leadership for college initiatives to transform basic skills instruction, transition high school and adult learners to college programs, offer quality instructional support across the curriculum, and develop a teacher preparation pipeline, and implement an apprenticeship in a non-traditional sector. So welcome, Lisa. Um, our next panelist is Marquita Friday. She's the Director of Career Programs for the Maryland State Department of Education. And she currently serves as the Director of Career Programs for the Division of Career and College Readiness at the Maryland State Department of Education, where she has held progressively responsible positions since 1998. Um, she oversees the department's youth apprenticeship initiative through the development and statewide expansion of Apprenticeship Maryland. So welcome, Marquita. Uh, Sean Kelly, the assistant principal and industry liaison for Dennis Technical Education Center. Um, Dennis, uh, Sean is an experienced educator with a passion for school redesign, career technical education and work-based learning a thought leader, instructional coach, mentor, career advisor, teacher, artist, and craftsman with a proven record of creativity and design. Welcome, Sean. And Christy Snyder, the LEAP Director, Project for Pride in Living, PPL. Uh, LEAP is the Learn and Earn to Achieve Potential program. Um, Christy is the Director at Project for Pride in Living. She's been dedicated to serving students, who do not have the access to the culture of power uh, for some time. She currently partners with multiple schools and GED programs to support young people who have had county involvement to set their career dreams and make them happen. So welcome, Christy, to the panel. Uh, just another general reminder, if you have questions, please uh, place them in the chat. We'll be documenting those questions and we'll be asking those at the end of the session. <clears throat> So I want to start with Sean by asking about the importance of expanding access to post-secondary education and training, as well as creating more good jobs for residents. We know that youth apprenticeship is designed to provide both at the same time so that high school students can earn dual credits and credentials while they're getting paid at the same time. How could this be a transformational model to expand opportunity in your region? How is youth apprenticeship important for how you think about educating and preparing our young people for the future to promote more ex equitable education and employment outcomes? Sean. Thank you, Pam. Um, again, I'm Sean Kelly. I'm sitting here in Boise, Idaho in my office at DTEC. We're called the Dennis Technical Education Center. We're a CTE high school here in Boise. Um, we serve a variety of different high schools in Boise, as well as a couple of the surrounding areas. Um, students also homeschool students, online school students come to us to take um, a variety of different CTE classes, as well as um, we're now uh, getting students into registered apprenticeships. Um, the simple answer to your question on uh, what is the impact of apprenticeship? Um, the simple answer is I feel it's everything. Uh, you know, work-based learning and that highest form of work-based learning, which is apprenticeships, um, is what I feel the future of education. You know, I've been in education working as kind of trying to be a change agent for the last 25 years within the public school system. And just everything that I see, what's gone on over the, especially the last two decades and now where we're at and where we're headed, there's a really bright future if, if we um, jump on this opportunity now. Um, we have an election coming up and if I were running for president, 
um, my, uh, my entire domestic agenda would be based around apprenticeship. Because when you look at apprenticeship, it has the potential to positively impact so many different areas. Um, everything, everything from the economy, to the jobs, unemployment rate, the skills gap, um, infrastructure. And the reason we're all here is also it can impact positively education and equity. Um, with that power, we have the chance to reimagine what learning could or should like look like in public schools. Um, apprenticeship and work-based learning in general, it's kind of the hot item right now. It's the new fad in education. Hopefully we do this well so it's not just a fad and it continue on, continues on because it's such a powerful options multiplier, I think, for students. Um, when you look at what's going on right now because of uh, COVID-19 and the amount of disengagement we're seeing from students around the country, we've uh, started the year virtually. We're coming, getting ready to start back, um, coming in on a staggered schedule, but I've never seen so many students struggling um, academically and being disengaged right now. And I think we're seeing one of the causes of this, we're seeing the result of that is we've had almost two decades of no child left behind and what later became the Every Student Succeeds Act, where the focus was on accountability and high stakes testing instead of experiential project based learning and career exploration. That's where it really needs to shift to. And when you are disengaged from that, what you have is what I like to call content without context. We're, we're, we're giving lots of content online. It limits what we're able to do right now. And so without that context, students are like, I, I don't really care about this right now. I've got so many other things going on at home. I can't, I have very limited access to uh, food. Um, parents are maybe unemployed right now spotty internet at best. Um, and so that equity or that achievement gap is just getting broader. And so if we're not careful and we don't do this right, we could see the same thing happen with uh, apprenticeships as well. Um, because again, without access and opportunity, that gap widens. And if we're not really intentional about how we implement um, apprenticeships and who we're uh, recruiting and targeting, that gap can continue to wide or we can close that gap depending on how we implement it. Um, but that education, what it's done in the past is created this disconnect between what students are learning now in school versus what they need to know to be successful in the real world. And so I ask the question, shouldn't school and the real world be the same thing? They, we need to make that connection between what students are doing in the real world to or what they're doing in the classroom to what is going on in the real world. Um, that's the power of apprenticeship. We're getting students out and they're using that academic knowledge, combining it with um, high technical skills to create these opportunities for students that are going to send them on a trajectory that um, I don't think anything else can do. Um, finally, you know, when uh, I'll, I'll pick on math as, as an example, how many of you, I know there's a, we can't see you right now, but how many of you ever thought or um, said out loud to your teacher in your math class, when am I ever going to use this? Raise your hand. I know everybody out there, if you're not raising your hand, you're lying. Um, and so that's the power of apprenticeship is we're bringing that context when you're going to use it. So we're a career and tech ed high school. And so our students don't ask that question, when are we going to learn this? And especially our students who are now in paid internships and apprenticeships. The only time they ask the question, when am I ever going to use this is because they want to do more of it. Um, and so I think there's a lot of power and opportunity that we have here if we do it right. In terms of equity in education, I think equity, when you boil it down, it comes down to two things, access and opportunity. And if we do this right, and we provide more access for students, our most disadvantaged students, and especially opportunity, because that's where the gap broadens is, they don't have the experiences of maybe some another student who has more opportunity or resources. And so when you give those opportunities and you give that access, you close that gap down. Um, the story of Mark Well yesterday really resonated with me. Um, and he mentioned in there, in his own words, he wasn't sure if he, if it had, if his, the decision for him to be able to be accepted to college was based solely on SAT and ACT scores, 
he wasn't sure that he would get in to the school of choice that he wanted to do. But because of apprenticeship and those opportunities that were opened up for him, it sent him on a career path that is amazing. And so we need more of that. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about this a little more in other questions, but one of the knocks on uh, apprenticeship is tracking. And I, I would say to that, that it's, it's tracking based on your intention. If your intention is we have given these students lots of opportunity to explore different things and access to curriculum and technology, and they choose that path, that's not tracking. And so we need to be intentional, intentional on how we um, give access to students. And we need to really, I think in my mind, we need to push career exploration down into those primary school level. So we're giving opportunity and access and information. If a student doesn't know this occupation exists, how are they gonna choose that as a pathway? So the more we can push career exploration, hands-on activities, project-based learning, um, that's where we're going to make a difference in terms of equity. And so, yeah, I would just end it with apprenticeship is everything in my mind. It's the future. So I think, Sean, there, there can never be enough said about apprenticeship and contextual learning and watching the light come on for students as they learn a theoretical concept and they're able to apply it in their day-to-day -day work. Um, I'm really glad you brought up the uh, suggestion that sometimes apprenticeship is uh, perceived as tracking, but you know, I think how often some of these young people end up in an apprenticeship program and it's life changing for them and they may have not otherwise had an opportunity to do so. So thank you for that. Um, I, I want to uh, ask Marquita a question. I, I know the fine folks in Maryland that work in the apprenticeship space um, with the uh, Department of Labor there, but you know, in your state, how does the State Department of Education facilitate youth apprenticeship growth across the state? And how does the youth apprenticeship program in Maryland connect to your state Department of Education's career technical education system? And you're on mute, Marquita. My apologies. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, in one sense, that question is one and the same because the way we deliver our Apprenticeship Maryland program in Maryland is we deliver it as a CTE program. So in Maryland, career and technical education is graduation pathway. And so by offering, by offering Apprenticeship Maryland as a CTE program, students can graduate by being an apprentice or being a youth apprentice. We work at elbow, should I say, with our partners at the Maryland Department of Labor, along with the Maryland um, Department of Commerce and the Maryland Chamber of Commerce to implement this program along with our local school system. So there's a wonderful team of people who are coming together to really put this move this initiative forward. I think you may have heard in the previous panel session that Maryland has 16 school systems that are currently doing the Apprenticeship Maryland program. That might seem small for most states because most states have hundreds of school systems. In Maryland, we only have 24. So really, we have two thirds of our state that are implementing the Apprenticeship Maryland program, which is very significant. And we are seeing more school systems adopt the program as we go along. And so what we're looking for in terms of expansion, we're looking to bring in more companies, more businesses. As I said, we work very closely with the Maryland Department of Labor. And I have to thank, uh, thank Jennifer Griffin, who is my colleague and coworker on this initiative. Uh, she does a lot of the point work in terms of really working with school systems to come on board and make sure that they have an understanding of what the program entails. And so, as I said, you heard from the previous panel how important this initiative is to the state. And as Sean just said, I truly believe it is a, it can be a life-changing experience for many of our students who otherwise might not have had the opportunity or not maybe not even had the interest into um, pursuing a post-secondary education. I think sometimes this can be the impetus for them to not just do an apprenticeship, but also do an apprenticeship and career, uh, future career opportunities. Uh, Markel was a great example of that. 
And so he talked about his dream of going to Clemson. So we have students who are coming into an apprenticeship and realize and realizing through their apprenticeship program that they are capable of doing college level work, that they can be successful in college. And so that they are not only doing the apprenticeship, but they're doing the apprenticeship plus they're going to school. So they're coming out with multiple credentials. And I think that is really the benefit. So I hate to think, hate to say or think that it's one or the other. And I really think the benefit of CTE in general, apprenticeship and specifically, is that there are ways to make it both. It's apprenticeship and it's college, so. I think uh, the language I've used with parents of young people who say, but I want my kids to go away to college and get a four-year degree. I just say this is a non-traditional way for them to do that and get it paid for. So exactly, you know, that, it really gets parents' attention when you start talking about that. And I know that Maryland currently has about 11,000 apprentices across the state, but they have several very large initiatives around advancing youth high school to youth apprenticeship programs. And so I really admire the work of the team there in Maryland and all the great work they've been doing. Thank you. So the next question is for Christy. Uh, so Christy, you represent a community organization implementing youth apprenticeship. How did you begin to integrate education pathways into the youth apprenticeship program you are developing? And what are the important educational elements that you need to consider? And who do you tap as partners to collaborate with you on building those pathways? Well, that's a lot. Um, so hi, everyone. I'm Christy Snyder. Um, I'm grateful to be on the panel. I think for us, it's we are a little bit of an odd duck here in Minnesota um, in that we have a primary population, which is youth that are systems involved. So foster care, young people in juvenile justice, young people experiencing homelessness, and young parents. And with that primary population and with everything that we do, we start with youth voice, youth power, and understanding what young people need in order to get their secondary credential and then move into the next phase of their careers. Um, so with that, like, I think we buck a little bit of a trend. We, of course, like lean on career and technical education, but for a lot of our young people that are um, over age and under credit, um, they don't need electives. And I think that when you look at um, evidence across the system, you see that young people that are in career and technical education are doing so much better because they have more time in their schedule to take career and technical education credits. So for us, we um, have embedded our career exploration course in an English 1112 course. So they're able to get English credits and then also um, a, we dashed in a little econ there so that they are able to get that because everyone seems to fail economics at some point in their life. Um, so we, we really do want to make sure that the first thing that we start is with those young people, what they will actually be able to take as they are moving towards their secondary credential. And so, like I said, we are a critical component of that. For Opportunity Youth, um, they are focused on their time. They, are, they don't have time to, to spend, and so they really need to be thoughtful of that. They are thoughtful about their power and choice. And so I think about the graphic that Brent shared earlier and those three components and the intermediary is in the center. I would push us to the outside and have young people in the center because young people need to be the ones that are articulating their power, their voice, their skills, their strengths, and adults need to be around them, lifting them up into their next opportunity. So for us to think about integrating educational pathways, um, I was a former teacher in Baltimore City for eight years, so let's give it up to Maryland. Um, but I do like to think about like the standards that are required and how we can knit those together so that young people can get their core subjects, they can take their career seminar class that in enables them to get into the work-based learning credits and then move that forward. We have a huge issue here in Minnesota with getting CTE teachers licensed. Um, there is only actually one place to get certified as a work-based learning in, um, instructor in the state of um, Minnesota, and it's at a very um, expensive private college, so hooray for that. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I think that that, that is, becomes an issue, and so thinking about working in the alternative space of how you layer in credits. So if you have an English licensed teacher, you can get a waiver for a work-based learning teacher for a certain number of years. And then how we think about 
collaborating with other partners to pay for that education. So that is a core component of thinking about um, how we leverage our relationship with the city of Minneapolis, Hennepin County, which is the county that Minneapolis is in, and then additionally the state dollars um, so that we can really make sure that whatever we're doing, we're leaning into what young people need for the secondary credential because they won't take it unless it, it gets them to high school graduation. And then they can, from there, ease them into that larger um, pathway. And as an intermediary, we know we can't do everything, but we know that we can raise the issues what need to happen. And so we are able to bring a big tent, um, knitting in the social support. So thinking about MFIP and other SNAP ENT and other sources that young people have access to and making sure we're able to leverage some of those dollars for them to stay on path and on course towards their ultimate career. And Certainly, we are thoughtful of leveraging the early middle college dollars that Brent mentioned earlier. Um, we are unique in Minnesota in that if you're at an alternative school, you can take developmental education at the college so that if you don't test college ready, you can still have access to that. And so that is a game changer for us, but it also means having young people believe that that is something that they are meant to do and having that as a, a possibility for them in the future. So there is a lot that we do to braid things together to make sure that youth with the most barriers are able to be successful in their apprenticeships. I hope I answered your question, Pam. Uh, it's, it's, it was a really good answer. I just think about, you know, the foster care population, the former justice involved and all the obstacles that they face along the way. and how oftentimes it takes an intense amount of wraparound services to help these youth be successful, especially in an apprenticeship program when it comes to things like transportation, even, you know, food security, uh, clothing, all of those things. And so community organizations are really a critical partner um, to help these young people. So thank you. That's right. Thanks. So our next question is for Lisa. Um, Lisa, if you could explain why your public institution of higher education was willing to step up and play such a pivotal role in developing youth apprenticeship in the region and facilitating this partnership. How did Berkeley City College incorporate youth apprenticeship into existing programs and pathways at the post-secondary level? Oh, good morning, everyone. Uh, hello from the Bay Area. Uh, California community colleges have shifted their focus from expanding access to increasing student equity and success. And BCC, Berkeley City College, uh, where I'm the dean, we have limited partnerships with high schools with limited success. Like maybe the student uh, will pass a college level class, maybe. And limited partnerships with employers with limited success. Maybe a student would land an internship. Um, youth, the youth apprenticeship model requires a strong partnership between the college, high school, and employer, and a commitment on the part of each to the success of each apprentice. So now the possibilities are that students complete college credits and earn credentials, and they attain meaningful work experience along a pathway to a career. Um, so in, in recent years, and especially during COVID, um, there's a severe shortage in two sectors of the workforce in which Berkeley City College has academic programs, teacher preparation and social work and human services. Um, at the same time, our local high schools have created academies or small learning communities around interest areas and begun to partner with Berkeley City College specifically to build pathways for students interested in careers that impact the, impact the health and education of the members of their communities, teacher prep and social work and human services. So now we have an opportunity to come together in two non-traditional sectors from a workforce driven perspective to transform what used to be long academic pathways with barriers between institutions to, the, to reach the credential and barriers between employers to advance. And now we can create an earn and learn program with seamless transitions for students. So I really love that, you know, career academy model to pre-apprenticeship to full apprenticeship. I think if if you can give students dual credit and give them early exposure through a career uh, career academy model that it really sets the student up for success. Um, I've seen some really remarkable programs that were modeled after that and 
and you know where young people have a seamless pathway from high school into their youth apprenticeship program and they're getting dual credit at the same time. So that's a remarkable example. Um, I'm gonna ask all of you to answer this. Sean, we'll start with you. I mean, we all know from working in this space for a long time that youth apprenticeship is new uh, for many and it challenges really the traditional idea of education. When you say the word apprenticeship, people typically think it's just for trades occupations. You know, we're seeing a lot of really cool models that are um, in non-traditional non sectors like IT and healthcare. Um, and so really trying to break that paradigm of that traditional idea in a rigid separation between school and work. So what do you think has been the most challenging for you in partnering with your education partners and really helping them to see the benefits of youth apprenticeship and have you met more resistance from high school districts or college partners? And why do you think that is? So Sean, could you answer that? That's an interesting question because for us, we um, are fortunate in that it's really take apprenticeship, the idea of apprenticeship and work-based learning has really taken hold here in Idaho. And um, from you know the secondary level, to post-secondary, our workforce development council is pushing it hard and up to our governor who is all, all in on apprenticeship and work-based learning. So from our end, it's really for me um, as kind of the industry liaison, the barriers have been the employers, um, not wanting to, convincing them to take a youth apprentice. But sticking with um, your question uh, in terms of post-secondary, some of the cool things that Idaho's done is um, uh, around equity and access is we have what's called advanced opportunities. So every high school student has access to four, over $4,000 that they can use for overload credits, dual credit and um, certification testing. And so that money can be used for that. So those classes and those certifications are free for students. And so that has opened up the doors for access there. Um, we have just recently our tech, all of our techno, uh, technical colleges have um, developed a new Associates of Science degree that incorporates and will take apprenticeship experience. So people who have gone and got an apprenticeship and wanna come back and get an Associates degree, that work experience will be credited. And so really all they have to do is take a couple general classes and now they have their Associates in Science. Um, and then something that we're doing here at DTEC that I'm really proud of and excited about is we're, we've developed, um, we're piloting the first uh, high school cybersecurity program in the state. And in conjunction with that, we're on a workforce development grant with Boise State University, and they're um, building up uh, their cybersecurity program. And so it's kind of cool because we're going together in lockstep. We just had a meeting yesterday where uh, the director shared their new bachelor's degree with us on what that's going to look like. So we've been working together as we're building a high school program. You have the local four-year university building their program in, con in collaboration with us. And so what he's able to do is take into account what our students are doing so that they can seamlessly jump into their program. And um, not only will the, the certifications that they earn will be credited and that will um, take care of many of their 400 level classes that they won't have to take depending on what certifications they pass. If they have an apprenticeship or an internship, they can earn up to 15 university credits as well counting towards that degree. Um, so it's, it's I, as far as I know, it's kind of the first time I've heard of anyway, where a high school program and a college program are working in conjunction and developing a program at the post-secondary level, um, taking into account how can they, our students go straight into their um, program without losing a step and continue to be in that apprenticeship um, it's all asynchronous, mostly online, so it allows them to continue working in that apprenticeship as well as moving on and getting that degree in cybersecurity. So it's pretty cool. We're excited about it. So I really think these two plus two models um, from, you know, community college to university are critical to these non-traditional sector apprenticeship positions. We don't want to put a student into a degree program in IT and just let them finish with a two-year degree, it's likely that they would not be able to land a career job. And so giving them the opportunity to go on and earn that you know, four-year degree and to encourage them along that completion pathway, I think is, is really, really important. Um, thank you, Sean. Christy, could you take that question? 
Sure. I mean, I think that there are a lot of things at play. I mean, um, probably core to it is mindset, um, both for um, employers and for young people themselves. Um, I think when you hear that I get to work with young people that are quote unquote opportunity youth, people have a particular mindset. Um, and I like to challenge that in that it is, honestly, these are the youth that I get to work with are the most resilient, they're the most loyal and um, passionate, but it is definitely something that we have to continually talk through. Um, currently, after following the murder of George Floyd, um, there is a, lo a lack of hope in the community and we're seeing a lot of people disengage. So I think that that is something that we're, is a new thing that we're focusing on. Um, we have a lot of bon like bonkers policies here in Minnesota, um, so it's hard to follow Sean with all that positivity, but um, I will say that there is like, for us, um, we pay into a UI system, employers pay into a UI system, and so they do not want to pay for wages, so we have to get very creative. Um, so we are blending with the on-job, on-the-job training um, funds with Youth WIOA. We are working with the city of Minneapolis to figure out like how we can pay for employer wages in that direction, um, because there there has to be a lot more blending because employers feel like they've done their due diligence by paying into that fund. Um, so a lot of braiding is necessary, and then policies around dual enrollment. Um, we have it, which we're very excited about, but um, it takes away from the average daily attendance metrics for the, in the alternative schools, and it doesn't give enough money for the colleges to cover their costs. So um, unlike the great state of Texas and North Carolina, which I feel like are leaders in that um, dual enrollment where they pay for both, Minnesota, we kind of lose for both. Um, so there is a robust policy agenda that we are working on and um, are grateful that our intermediator, intermediate Immediate status gives us the ability to just like use our elbows. So that's that's what I got to say. I think that it's important, you know, that people know about the braided funding opportunities and how you can take multiple funding streams and you know put them toward a program. There are also, I know in my work here in North Carolina, we, we have private funders approach us uh, pretty often about philanthropic funding. And so you know, for our people that are listening in today, don't forget about those people because they're always looking for great opportunities, especially for opportunity youth. So Marquita, could you take that question as well? Uh, yes, so just like everyone else, Maryland has its challenges in terms of youth apprenticeship. Uh, sometimes it's with employers in terms of getting employers to not worry about insurance, especially when we have companies like manufacturing and so forth. I can say that since we have started the Maryland Apprenticeship Maryland program, one of our goals has been to look for apprenticeship and non-traditional non-traditional apprenticeship areas, such as the construction trade areas. In the construction trade areas, we've been doing apprenticeship much longer than we've actually had the Apprenticeship Maryland program. But now we're looking to go into manufacturing, into STEM, into banking and finance, just all different types of areas. And so sometimes to get employers that are not accustomed to doing apprenticeship or not thinking about um, hiring youth, having it's a mindset change. I think I heard that before. I think Christy said it was a mindset change. So for some of our employees, it's a mindset. But one of the things that we do is whenever a school system says that they want to implement an apprenticeship, implement a program, we start off with a technical assistance visit where we say, get your school system people to leadership, get your post-secondary people together, get your Maryland chain, I mean, get your local chamber, get some of your, um, some of your employer partners to come in and let's all have a conversation. Let's everyone hear how to implement this program and everyone hear the information at the same time. We also have the Maryland Department of Labor. They've assigned navigators to certain regions of the state. And so they work on both the adult side as well as the, uh, the youth apprentice side. And so they will bring employers to the school systems. Uh, we have someone designated in all of our school systems that are doing the program to specifically work with the navigators and talk to the employers about um, bring, getting students to um, interview for those positions. And so, and sometimes uh, we even have employers that come to us 
for more of a statewide initiative. A good example of that is the um, NSA, National Security Agency. They were looking for people for, they wanted us to do a CTE program specifically for um, in foreign language or world languages. And we said, well, not sure we could do it in terms of our traditional CTE program, but I'm pretty sure we can do it as an apprenticeship program. And so they went before the Maryland Apprenticeship and Training Council. That's what all of our employers have to do. They were approved by by uh, the Maryland Apprenticeship and Training Council. And really what they wanna do is they wanna bring on students and this, and I'm so proud of this. They wanna bring in students to train them or grow them to be world language analysts starting in high school. So they'll come in on a government pay scale. Uh, they'll start working while they're in high school. They will pay for about 80% of the students' college tuition. The students will continue to work while they're in college and then they will have employment after they graduate and they'll go higher on the GS scale. And so typically most of our youth apprentices make about 12, 15 an hour. That's just an average. They have to be paid at least a minimum wage in order for the employers have to agree to pay our youth apprentices um, at least minimum wage. But in terms of challenges, I would say for just getting some employers getting them, trying to change that mindset, although we do have some that are just very eager to come on board. And if they're eager to come on board, we'll, say, we'll help you, we'll help bring them on board. So we're very eager to expand our, uh, our program to, I would say the areas that are not traditionally, um, they have not traditionally done apprenticeship programs. In terms of dual credit, Maryland, Back in 2013, uh, law was passed, passed the longest name, so I may not say it correctly, but the College and Career Readiness College Completion Act of 2013. And basically what that says for, it allows students to take up to four um, courses at their local community college. And so that's, com that's paid for. And depending on the student's income and so forth, the, there might be some fees that have to be paid, but the base tuition is available to them to take up to four courses um, prior, to leave, prior to leaving high school. And so those courses are on the credit side of the house and they can be used to meet the classroom related instruction for apprenticeship if the employer says that's what they're looking for. Uh, that's the key thing. So if we have a student that's currently in our CTE program and an employer says, okay, based on what they're taking, that CTE program will fulfill the classroom-related instruction. Well, then we work with the um, employer to make that happen. I think the hardest thing for school systems sometimes is trying to get out the way. And when I say that, meaning we have to take down all of the barriers that keep students from being able to participate in apprenticeships. It's different from our CTE program. So just trying to really be creative and thinking of all the ways to take down barriers. Now there are some that will always exist and they've been said earlier, such as transportation, uh, that's a barrier. Um, and we still have not cracked that nut yet, but we, are, but we continue to work and really look for ways to expand our program to all students and make sure that they can have this opportunity. And I think, I hope I answered your question. You did a great job. So I just want to point out that um, I wrote a blog for New America last year on the importance of community collaboration, especially in youth apprenticeship programs. You know, how you have to have partners like Christie's organization, your K-12, your public schools, sometimes a community foundation, but it really takes a lot of, you know, additional wraparound services. If anybody figures out how to solve the transportation issue, you'll probably win a Nobel Peace Prize. So, um, so I think I hear that so often from so many partners is how do we get the kids to and from school and work? So thank you, Marquita. Lisa, you. could you take that question? Sure. Um, well, as I mentioned uh, earlier, so yeah, dual credit is strong, you know, the strong opportunity in California. And, and like I mentioned, we had partnerships with high schools um, in, non-traditional sectors, but again, it was just to get students, maybe the, the high school objective was just to get students early college credit, like one course. Um, and 
uh, for us, I think the challenge is, the challenge is probably um, greatest with uh, employers because in these uh, areas of teacher preparation and in um, uh, human services and social work, typically um, the model for getting work, work experience while, while studying is an internship or volunteer. And so, um, you know, I would argue that a rigid separation between school and work just increases equity gaps um, for under-resourced and under-opportunized youth. Um, that because uh, the highly resourced advantaged kids, they have the social capital and support to take courses that give them depth of study in their area of interest, like AP courses or college courses. And they also get jobs and internships through connections and, or if they, when there are internship opportunities, they're competitive. And when high school kids apply for them, those who are better resourced and therefore have, you know, more to uh, throw at that application will be selected. And so um, it's interesting because, uh, so this separation between, you know, work and, uh, and school is more often imposed then on the students that we deem as underprepared. And in reality, <laughs> they're, they're underprepared because we haven't given them the opportunities for depth of study and work experience to be prepared. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so along those lines, um, you know, if we're committed to student equity, we have to be committed to providing all students especially those that are under-resourced and opportunized, the opportunity and support to, do, to get college courses that provide depth in their area of interest, as well as the, the work experience. So now uh, we have a strong, we develop these strong partnerships with high schools. I think that the equity issue and the understanding of this is, is strong. Um, but uh, we have, we're encouraged by one, um, and we have a, an apprenticeship partnership with, a, with the Head Start YMCA program. Um, that uh, gives us some courage to go into the education side. But like, for example, we've been approached by another school district that wants to do a grow your own teacher program. And the model all the way is that students, you know, volunteer and do all these extra things until they get their credential and then you're welcome back. Where we're trying to build a pathway, an earn and learn pathway for students that has the credentials along the way at each point of, at each completion of, of um, units of study or work experience, there's another opportunity for the student to move up in their work experience, get a higher, get a wage bump, and also uh, attain another certificate or degree that gives them more, uh, gives them another credential. So um, in the, I think the challenge right now for us with the uh, social work and human services is finding a, a, a partner, partners, our first idea was that we would work with, um, community-based organizations, but uh, they're, again, used to this kind of volunteer, like maybe we'll take your person kind of model. But then now we've, we've, we've uh, started talking to the Berkeley uh, Department of Parks and Recreation, where they have a youth works program, which seems like a natu natural partner for us that our, our uh, youth apprentices could do their summer job experience with the youth works program. And it would serve us and them because the city of Berkeley constantly comes to the college and says, you know, we need, people and we have jobs, we need a diverse workforce, we need your students you know, who have lived experience out here making a difference in the community. And it's like, yeah, great, but then make that easy for them. Take away all those barriers where they had like, they, they, they go here and apply or go over here and, you know, or did you hear about that opportunity? Oh, you didn't hear about it, you're not in. Um, I, I really think what cemented this for me was I, the, um, at, Berkeley High School has their AMPS program. It's like a, for medicine and public service interest, that's their academy. And um, they invited me to do mock interviews with their students. And this is a very diverse group of students, many of them low income. And when I talked to the students, they would tell me like about how they're, these efforts they're making to get all these different pieces for themselves. So like, you know, I have an internship at Children's Hospital. I work there six hours a week. But I need to help support my family, so I have a job in, my, in the restaurant over here. And then I'm taking this AP course. Why that course? Well, it's the one I could get into. Okay, not related to what you want to study. Um, and just hearing how fragmented that experience was, 
And even in our own work with high school partners, if we offer the apprenticeship program at the high school, the issue is the high school schedule and trying to fit it into the day, even though you can get dual credit. And identifying a group in one high school of students that are particularly interested in this non-traditional sector as well can be challenging, who really want to do the, who commit to the apprenticeship program. So that's why we thought, well, if we move the program to the, to the college, uh, first of all, Berkeley, Berkeley High School is across the street from us, so that's easy. The transpo on that one is golden. <laughs> um, although our partners in Oakland, uh, Castlemont High School, um, we, have, we have to deal with that transportation issue unless there's some way, we, we do now have the possibility of offering a better, we have a better shot at serving the students online with all the new tools we've gotten during COVID in online instruction. So that's another possibility to have sort of a hybrid online experience, at least for the, um, the, the college courses. But again, apprenticeship, although they are developing apprentices on, apprenticeships online, it's not, you know, there are people that are serving their community in online support, but that's not, uh, that's not what, what we had imagined. Um, so uh, yeah, there's an opportunity to, um, to open up to all of our high schools and then to really select, you know, the students from those high schools who are uh, the targeted group of low income under opportunized students that we would like to bring into the program and support the heck out of them at the college. You know, in, in, we have all of our, uh, we have health services and health and wellness and uh, learning support and all of that. And, um, and make it like one evening a week. Well, a lot of high school students are looking for something to do outside and then do the, um, the, uh, the job, the work experience during the summer so that they're not trying to juggle high school, maybe play a, play a sport they like, have this, you know, work in their family restaurant and then, you know, uh, try to do their apprenticeship hours at the same time. And uh, for high school students, you know, it is competitive around here to get, high, to get uh, jobs for the summer. And a lot of students are left out of those opportunities anyway. So we've kind of come around to that hopeful model that we can bring all of this together. But we do need to get the employers on board with these wage increases and you know, commitment to hiring our students. And I guess kind of hold them accountable for saying to us all the time, we want your students, we need this diverse workforce. It's like, well then commit to it. Commit to the support, commit to the equity issue, like to, you know, to deal, really dealing with these equity issues that our students face and helping us to remove these barriers for students that do need, even in high school, to contribute to their family income. And they are ambitious, yeah. I think so often from employers, we hear more about the risk factors with youth apprenticeship and you know, they want to know, like, is, is this going to make my insurance liability increase because I'm going to have a young person in my facility? So, you know, having a, a good answer for them and an employer to employer discussion is always helpful. So an employer that already has a youth program um, can sell that idea to another employer much easier than the rest of us uh, in, in the community partnerships. So I want to... Um, go to a couple of the questions that we have in the chat. Uh, we only have, you know, 10 minutes left. So I, I would say, you know, keep your answers brief if you would. But one of the questions is, is your youth apprenticeship pathway ran by a K-12 or post-secondary partner as a CTE program? Would anybody like to address that? I will. That's the easy one. So it's run in the secondary level and we work with our partners but apprenticeship maryland is run out of the maryland state department of education which oversees our k-12 through education system and this is a question uh particularly for christy are you aware of any college or university programs who have students interested in unpaid internships with workforce development programs yeah, I mean, in Minnesota, we do. There's a, there's a lot of unpaid internships available. We never offer them to our young people without having them paid. So either we use um, philanthropic dollars or other sources, but um, our young people could never do an unpaid internship. And so even um, later today, we have a meeting where we're trying to extend K-12 funding up to age 24 in Minnesota. We're working on a pilot and we're building in a community health worker certificate, uh, apprentice and we would want that to be paid. So I think that that, um, yeah, unpaid never works for our population. 
So Sean, a question for you, what are some ways you were able to build a connection with your employer partners? Um, use, utilizing first off our instructors and through CTE, we're required to have advisory committees. And so reaching out with industry partners through that, some of our um, most active partners, we're starting with them um, in order to uh, engage with them and, and get them on board with taking one of our apprentices. It's, that's been our biggest challenge is, as others have mentioned, you know, specifically the liability piece. And so one of the things that we're doing is um, we're starting to track with the employers who say yes, we're starting to track with them who's their insurance carrier. So when a, uh, an employer says, oh, I can't hire under 18, my insurance won't allow me. Oh yeah, we've got somebody who will do that. And so trying to think of what are the excuses and have an answer for them before uh, or right away when they give that excuse, they'll say, oh, we, we, we can't hire 18, under 18. Have you asked your uh, HR department? No. Okay, go ask them. And then the HR might say, oh, our insurance carrier won't allow that. Have you asked them? Oh, no. <laughs> so get them to ask and, and ask questions. And, and you have to be, I, I get, you got to be a little bit of a bulldog, I guess, and, and in, a, in a kind way and push and, and continue to revisit. And hey, just want to check in with you. We've got a great student I think would really be a good fit for you guys. What, have you thought more about taking on apprentice? Those are the kind of things that um, we're starting to see have an impact. Can I jump in real quickly too? Yeah, sure. um, I would also recommend doing state and local government as internships because what happens there is that they become the champions and um, with the WIBs and other structures, they're able to become your um, trailblazer. And so we have a lot of like our very first successful apprenticeship was with the Minnesota Department of Transportation. And that really opened us up to really thinking about it. And state employment is so good. They have such good benefits. It's a structure. There's union jobs. And so I really just would encourage people to look at state and local government. Can I add, add to that? I just wanted to say that what some school systems are doing, they're actually looking for at positions within the school system. For example, one school system realized that many of their buildings are, I'll use the word ancient, and that the workforce that they had there, industrial maintenance people who were doing, taking care of the buildings, um, they were much older, well, not much older, but they were in their 50s near retirement. So they saw that there was a CTE program in existence for industrial maintenance. So why not offer, why not offer apprenticeships to these students to actually bring them into and have them work for the school system and they could start while they're there. So that kind of took care of part of the transportation problem um, as well, because they were working with a population that was already there that was learning how to do that work anyway. So that's just another creative way in which a school system, because they do hire people beyond teachers. They have IT staff, they have public relations staff. And so what we find that some of our school systems are doing, they are actually um, becoming apprentices. Uh, they're offering apprenticeships to students to come in and do the work that the school system does outside of teaching. So that's just another way of going about it. So a couple of things, uh, we have questions about things like third party staffing agencies. We have questions about uh, if you're starting a brand new apprenticeship program from scratch. So there, uh, there is guidance from the uh, ETA at the USDOL on hiring young students through third party agencies. I've done it myself. They were under 18 students. So it is allowable in the right situation. And for a brand new program, the Apprenticeship USA Toolkit on the ETA website is a really quite amazing um, resource. So, and of course, any of us are available to help along the way with things that we've created. And, um, and, and I think absolutely, Christy just provided her email address to uh, Christina Locke. So you can make that connection after the session. So. I just want to take a minute to thank all of you for participating. I'm going to just take a few minutes to close out the session. Um, um, Pam, could I share one just real quick? We didn't get to talk about tracking really. And kind right. of one cautionary thing I would like to say in relation to that, I talked a little bit about intention. It's all about your intention and how you're placing that student. But I would caution everybody that's 
involved in apprenticeship, I'm really getting nervous when I hear people, when we, and I think it's, it's, we're excited about apprenticeship, but we're almost creating this hierarchy of non-traditional versus traditional apprenticeships. And if we're not careful, we're going to have that create a hierarchy and then you're going to see tracking. And so we need to talk about both on the same level um, so that we don't have this, re we need to rethink what it means to go on and going on to college is a higher level than an apprenticeship. Well, don't do that in terms of apprenticeship itself with traditional and non-traditional apprenticeships. It would be my parting thought there. I'll, I'll make sure that New America shares a study um, that I participated in uh, last year on equity and intentional recruiting into youth apprenticeship programs. Uh, we could make that available to you, but we actually learned some great strategies for intentional recruiting uh, for underserved populations of young people. And uh, I, I think people who have tried some of those recruiting strategies have been very successful. So thanks to all of you. Um, I really appreciate your participation. It was a great session today.